So good afternoon for maybe most of you um, and uh, good morning for those of you who are joining from the, the, the US um, as well. I'm delighted to be here again today. Um, it's, I believe, slightly later than I was yesterday. So um, I, that doesn't mean I stayed in bed longer. It just meant that I had a little bit of time to uh, actually watch Scott and Stefan before uh, coming on. Um, I want to thank you all for being here, um, especially those of you who have made it the last two days. Your tenacity is really very much appreciated. And um, I hope that I can spend the next, you know, 50 minutes, 45, 50 minutes or so um, trying. Um, my attempt is really to put a little bit of a bow on things. Um, yesterday was a day where we spent a lot of time talking about the, um, the if you will, the reasons for GitOps and then also some of the you know, demonstrations of the outcomes that people have been achieving with GitOps-based approaches. Um, and then today has been a really far more you know, hands-on, like how do you actually do things? And so to wrap up the conference, I wanna kind of spend, um, given that today is day two, it's a little bit more concrete, I'm definitely going to, I allowed myself a little bit of free reign to put on that propeller hat that I, that you saw in one of my slides yesterday and go a bit techy. Now I'm not going to be doing like Scott or, or uh, Stefan did and actually show you, you know, real YAML and those types of things. I will be a little bit higher level than that, but bear with me. I think there's going to be a few places where we're going to be a bit techy as well. So it's a little bit on that balance between tech and um, business side. So without further ado, let me go ahead and share my slides, share my screen. Um, and so if I share this desktop, and um, I am assuming, and I can see in the GitOps Days Slack, uh, do let me know if you're not seeing right now, you should be seeing the GitOps Days schedule. And okay, excellent. So when I share, I am confident that you will see my slides. And so, excellent. Thank you, Stacy. Um, so uh, the the title of this session is, you know, what's your first or next step towards powerful GitOps? And is it an all good techie talks? The the answer to the question is, it depends. You know, if you will, that's kind of the foobar of uh, of of these types of dialogues. By the way, I'll share anecdotally the other day, I said something about foo and my husband said, what does that mean again? And I said, nothing. It's just something that us computer science nerds. My son is um, one year in on his uh, software engineering career. And when he and I are talking and he says something about foo, I think my husband just rolls his eyes. So in any case, it depends. So how do you get started? It depends. Well, it depends on a lot of things, but I decided to break things up into three different categories. The first is, and these are all very, these are all very valid entry points, but the entry points that I wanted to talk about here were, if you are an application team, how do you get started or what are the next steps? If you are a platform team, how do you get started and what are, or what are the next steps? And if you're somebody that's interested in extending this GitOps environment, what does that look like? And I hinted at this a little bit yesterday in my talk, and I'll hold off on you know, giving away any, any more on that because we don't have too, too much longer to go. So um, I'm going to start first with the applications. So my first bit of um, advice to you is if you are starting with applications, start with Kubernetes. Now, let me be clear here that GitOps is something that doesn't only apply to Kubernetes, but the reason that I'm suggesting that if you are in a state where you're getting started with GitOps, that perhaps the best place to get started with that is Kubernetes is because of the bookends. I talked about the bookends yesterday, and you've seen a version of this slide before, which really talks about these four principles of GitOps. And I talk about the bookends, and I wanna emphasize again that the reason I'm suggesting you start with Kubernetes in the application space 
is because you get these things for free from Kubernetes. If you are aiming to do something outside of the Kubernetes space, then you have to come up with a way of dealing with declarative configuration and you need a way of implementing software agents and having those software agents running. Remember that reconciliation pattern. We talked about GitOps patterns yesterday. And that reconciliation pattern is so central to cloud native operations. And that's really what GitOps is about, is these modern cloud native operations. So if you start with Kubernetes, you get the bookends for free. We know that we are declaring our application configuration, our manifests in YAML. Um, so we have declarative configuration and we know we have the delivery controllers that are going to keep that declarative configuration in line with the actual state of the system. Okay, so you get that for free. Now, of course, that means that when you're taking and you're applying the GitOps solution, you need to add the things that are in the middle of the screen. And that's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna talk a little bit about how you get started or make progress on implementing those other two elements that are gonna build out this slide. Now, this is gonna harken back on some of the things that you heard Stefan talk about, you heard Scott talk about, you heard Lee talk about, all of those things that you've been hearing all throughout today, kind of on a, in a concrete sense. I'm, this is, think of this as kind of a reminder or maybe a, a way of stitching all those things together. So I was just watching Stefan myself and he was showing you in his demo how he instantiated, he, he cloned a Git repository and then he had in there already a folder structure around things. Well, that's the first place that we're gonna start is we're gonna start on, okay, get the Kubernetes thing for free. Let's add the versioned immutable store and configure it properly. So what that means is that I want to really look at, okay, I've got the runtime environment. I know I'm gonna have the declarative configuration stored in Git. What does that look like? Well, my first recommendation to you is that you really need to think your, about your SDLC. You need to think about that software delivery life cycle because that is going to place requirements or it's gonna help you design all of this stuff. So when I say all of this stuff, let me be a little bit more concrete than that. Your SDLC, and by the way, when I talk about that, I mean the entire life cycle from the beginning stages where you're cutting code in an IDE and checking it into the GitHub repository. And then as you have seen throughout the couple of days, there's a CI system that is generating the container images for you um, and those types of things, all the way out into your production environment. But to get to production, you also have some other environments. You have a development environment in which you can start to test the basic configuration and making sure that, for example, your applications are truly stateless so that you have multiple instances, you're testing things like having an instance go away and the application is still up and running. Those are all part of your kind of, if you will, unit tests. Um, and I say unit tests, actually I'm putting kind of quotes up in the air, that those are kind of your unit tests. You have to include that as a part of your developer testing. And then you also have maybe a user accept acceptance testing environment, and then you have prod. So when I talk about the SDLC, I'm talking about that entire gambit. How do we support the early parts of the software development lifecycle as well as all the way out to production? So, when we're thinking, considering those, the first thing I want you to do is think about your runtime topology. Now, you might already be here. And what I'm talking about here is, am I using namespaces? Am I using separate clusters? How am I configuring RBAC? And you might already have all of this wired up. When I'm out talking to customers, they're usually fairly far along, not always, but they, they have started to think about these things. They understand, for example, the limitations of namespaces that it really represents more of a soft multi-tenancy than a hard multi-tenancy. 
they're starting to do the, that analysis on um, the failure domains and understanding what happens, you know, clusters still need to be upgraded and might need some downtime or clusters still can crash and those types of things. And so they're understanding those failure domains. And those are some of the things that you need to analyze. But you also, not just looking at it from a production setting, you need to analyze those requirements in the context of your entire SDLC. So again, you might be thinking, all right, well, in that soft, soft multi-tenancy that I was talking about, well, that's okay. We can have a single development cluster um, or maybe two development clusters if you want some type of a you know, DR scenario. And I'm gonna have multiple namespaces in that. One, each app team is gonna get its own namespace. So I don't need to maintain separate clusters at that level. But then when it comes to prod, I definitely want separate clusters for each of my microservices because I want to, I, I want to set up those failure domains. So those are the types of things that you're thinking about. Now, uh, there's the equivalent side and notice that I call that the runtime topology. On the other side is I'm going to call this the Git repo topology. So what are some of the topological elements that you're using on the Git side? Well, there's folders, branches, tags. Are you going to use separate repositories? And again, there's RBAC. So what you are thinking about here as well is your team structures and what are the requirements around those team structures? Where do you need to set up separation of separation of duties? What you know, different teams that you do you have? And so you see, you can see here that there's R back on the right hand side. There's R back on the left hand side. So really, you're thinking about both of those things. And again, you're thinking about your entire SDLC. I've got dev. I've got user acceptance testing. I've got production. You need to be thinking about that. And then. There is this. I've also got, it's not just the Git repo, I've got external stores. So I've got my image repository. We've been talking about that today. Yesterday, Luke Marsden in his talk around ML ops pointed out that a, a very common practice in the machine learning space is to have containers, images, you know, container images encapsulate the, you know, kind of the runtime environment, but then have the models for those um, runtime environments for the, for the machine learning applications, have those models be loaded in from an S3 repository. So you heard me, this is the category, if you remember, this is about setting up your versioned immutable store. GitHub, we know, is a versioned immutable store. But when I start thinking about things like the image repository or an S3 bucket, wait a minute, is that a versioned immutable store? So I'm not going to spend a long time talking about it, but I do want to highlight just a few things. Again, if you didn't hear me highlight this yesterday, in the earlier GitOps days this year, in May, I did a longer talk. I did it, what was called an overview and deep dive, a little bit of attention there. So, you know, a little high level, but also a little bit of a deep dive. I definitely did more of a deep dive on this topic of Git semantics. And I mentioned it yesterday. And I talked about the fact that there are certain things that are absolutely essential to GitOps that include things like versioning, having a version history that is ordered in time, that it be immutable, and that that facilitates things like repeatability, it provides safety nets so that you can do rollbacks or actually more like a roll forward by simply accessing an earlier point in time and you have the entire representation of things that were running at that time. So those are very important Git semantics. And on the left-hand side of the screen here, you see a Git log that I just you know, grabbed from the terminal. And you can see some of those elements that I just talked about, those Git semantics. You can see that I have versioning embedded in. Oops, sorry, that's not clickable. I have versioning baked in. So these commit SHAs, that is a versioning mechanism. Is it, it is a way of identifying a version where somebody can't accidentally go 
and replace that version with something else. And then you end up with a system that you can't recover. Because it's a Shaw, if you so much as insert a space somewhere, even an inconsequential change, you're gonna get a different Shaw. So that's what I mean by versioning deeply baked into this implementation of Git. You've got time ordering here. So you can see the time ordering that is set up here. And you can see that at every single one of these nodes, I have an entire representation of the state of the system. So going back to the question that I was posing, which is, well, if part of my runtime state is stored outside of Git in an image repository in an S3 bucket, am I compromising that requirement about versioned immutable store? And the answer is that you may have to implement, you have to think about implementing some of that into your entire system. So you, for example, when you're coming up with how you're going to put things into your image repository, and that's something that you're generally doing with your CI system, as a part of your CI system, you have to build into that CI system a mechanism that implements versioning in such a way that you can avoid that situation where somebody inadvertently or intentionally replaces a version without replacing the version number. So that's something you need to tool. And for goodness sake, you've heard it from multiple people already, don't ever use latest as your tag in your image repository. Now, that really is getting to the second bullet here, which is, okay, what you're effectively doing there is you are effectively figuring out what your keys, your database keys are for this store. Now, the third one here is really interesting, which is time ordering. So does that mean that I need to have an image repository that's time ordered? Does it mean that my S3 buckets, but wait a minute, S3 buckets don't apply this versioning thing. And what about this time ordering? They don't really have a historical thing and all of that stuff. How do I do that? Well, there's an interesting element here. And again, forgive me for getting a little computer science here, but what we're talking about here is by reference. The whole thing we're talking about here is, are we doing things by reference? Or are we doing things by value? By value would mean that I'm storing my images in Git. It would mean that I'm storing my machine learning models in Git or the parameters in Git. And we, we aren't always going to do that. But if you do it by reference, you do have to ensure the versioning thing that I was just talking about. But now you can, in fact, use the time ordering. You can use Git as the time ordering thing and just have it have references to the things that are stored in S3 or on image repositories or in some other external repository. So it's the combination of Git and these external repositories where you can start to achieve these Git semantics. Then of course, and that's the, what I'm pointing out in the last bullet there, and then of course you have to, you have to think about RBAC, okay? So all of these are the things that you need to be thinking through as you embark on your, your Git journey, is these are all the things that are involved in establishing the way that you're going to store these declarative configurations and references to the entities that are outside that declarative configuration. All right. So that's how you get started with the Git repository. And now what's left here? Well, we're gonna link them up, right? We're gonna link up the Git repository and the runtime environment. And for that, we are gonna use those delivery controllers that I talked about yesterday and that many of my colleagues have been talking about throughout the day, the, the day today. And it's perfect that I'm doing this talk right after Stefan's talk, where he described to you the latest greatest with Flux. And he described to you how we decoupled Flux, the original Flux, into various components. Well, now, hopefully, this is going to kind of stitch these things together from the how you get started to what are the mechanisms within the delivery controllers. And he talked about the source object. He talked about a source controller that will pick up on new instances of the source object 
and then do, you know, and, and deliver and pull those things and establish the cadence by which the Git repositories are, are um, you know, uh, reviewed and, and checked with for, for latest greatest. And he also talked about things like the customize controller. And so there's this notion of customizations, which say, all right, once the latest changes have been pulled into the Kubernetes cluster from the Git repository, then what do I need to do to compile that YAML in such a way that I can deliver it over into etcd? And then the runtime controllers will take over. And of course, you're going to stitch all of those things together in GitOps pipeline with GitOps pipelines. Okay, so to summarize what we've talked about here, get started with Kubernetes, design or understand your teams, because RBAC showed up everywhere, your runtime topology, clusters, namespaces, your GitHub structure or your Git repo structure, and how you're dealing with those external stores. Then design the GitOps pipelines that are going to stitch those things together, and you are well on your way. Okay, and you can do that incrementally. All right, so let's move on to the next thing, which is let's talk about well, what if I'm the platform team and I am delivering these capabilities, these application platforms to the teams that I just addressed here. I'm delivering that to them so that they can do the process that I just described um, and not have to worry about the infrastructure. I'm taking care of the infrastructure. And by infrastructure here, I'm actually including the cluster itself, the cluster that the application teams are just gonna use, the Kubernetes environment. I said, they start with Kubernetes. Well, you're now responsible for giving them that starting point. So let's go back then to this picture. What I'm talking about here is really GitOpsing those environments. Now, I'm going to start from the ground up, but I'll make a few com comments on this in, in just a little bit. Starting from the ground up, I'm going to say I've got lower level infrastructure. I've got some machines. They could be virtual. They could be physical machines. I've got some machines, but I want to turn those machines into a Kubernetes cluster. Now, I'm starting with the bookends again here, because if you remember when I was on the application side, I said start with Kubernetes because it already gives you two of the four things for free. It gives you the bookends. It gives you declarative configuration, and it gave you these software agents. Now, in the application setting, the software agents I was talking about were, of course, it's the things you're familiar with. It's the deployment controller. It is the replica set controller. It's the daemon set controller. It's all of those things that were baked into Kubernetes. But hang on, does Kubernetes, do I get something for free here if I'm going to try to actually establish clusters? Well, the answer is, well, it's not in Kubernetes mainline, but there is a community project in the CNCF that does give you the bookends. And yes, that's the cluster API project. Cluster API gives you the left bookend. It, it creates custom resource definitions that allow you to describe your clusters, that allow you to describe the machines and the cluster topology that are going to be running on those machines. Now, the reason the machine is there is that's the interface down into the lower level infrastructure. Remember I said, hey, I've got some machines and I want to turn those into a cluster. That's the way that you do that is with that machines.yaml. It's all declarative. So Cluster API brings you the left bookend with these CRDs. It also brings you the reconcilers. It also brings you an implementation for some of the controllers. And there's a whole host of controllers. And we could spend an entire morning, afternoon, or indeed even an entire day going through the details of those controllers. It's quite sophisticated and quite complex. Um, but the answer is that there's a lot of really um, good work that's going on in this space that is, in effect, packaging this for you. Just like you didn't have to build a deployment controller, you don't have to build all of these cluster management controllers. They're being built by the community. 
But there are these controllers, and I called out only a couple of them, the machine controller and the cluster controller. Those are the software agents. And there are implementations that are e either part of the cluster API project or implementations that are infrastructure specific. There are implementations that are specific to um, uh, VMware. There are uh, implementations that are specific to AWS, et cetera. So there's a number of different infrastructures that are supported. And I'll talk in just a moment about a particular infrastructure provider that we are very deeply involved in, okay? So you get these two things for free, well, for free by embracing cluster API stuff. So that means that if I've got the bookends for free, do I need to do anything special for the things on the inside? Well, the good news is, is no. The very process that I sent you through in the earlier part of the conversation where I built out, hey, you've got to create this, go through this process of structuring your Git repositories. And then you figured out what your, how you've structured your runtime environments. And then you use you know, something like Flux to connect those things together. That same exact process works here. It's all about structuring your Git repositories. It's all about creating your GitOps pipelines using the components that you have available like source controllers, customized Helm controller, and so on. Okay, so cluster API and GitOps are really truly a perfect fit. Now, I'm gonna talk about topology again. I warned you at the beginning of this conversation that I was gonna be a little techy. So when I start using the word topology throughout and R back throughout, of course, we're getting a little bit technical. So let's think about that topology because there's something that's really interesting about the topological elements here as well, especially for those of you who might be newer to the cluster API project. So if we go back to this picture, I said, okay, we've got declarative configuration in this machine.yaml and this cluster.yaml, and we've got these controllers that have been installed into the runtime. I'm emphasizing that and I'm pausing here for dramatic effect because I'm gonna come back to this point in just a moment. So those are the key elements. So let's kind of lump those things over here. Now, if I, need, if I have declarative configuration and I've got some agents that are running, well, I need a place first of all to store that declarative configuration. Hey, how about this? How about I store that declarative config configuration in etcd? Okay, well, that makes sense. Declarative configuration has been proven. It works well in etcd. And I, I need these controllers. I need these, these reconciliation loops. And of course, I have a great runtime for running reconciliation loops. And that's Kubernetes, right? So those things right here, are naturally fit into a Kubernetes setting. I'm going to say, I'm going, going to make that first assertion to say, okay, well, this machinery, this engine is going to be a Kubernetes cluster. The thing that's going to allow me to do cluster management is a Kubernetes cluster itself. And I'm going to call that the management cluster. Now that's foreshadowing the diagram that I'm going to build out here. If I then have that management cluster, then how can I use that management cluster to establish additional clusters? Well, it's actually quite simple. What I'm going to do is I'm going to, in a GitHub repository, add a machine.yaml and a cluster.yaml. That is my declaration that I need a new cluster. Those reconcilers are going to recognize that. Oh, actually, sorry. The reconcilers don't see that yet because it's in a GitHub repository, right? Something has to deliver those things from the GitHub repository into the runtime environment. And that, of course, are your GitOps pipelines powered by Flux, for example, at the background. So source controller, customized controller, let's say. Once that delivery happens, then those reconcilers will say, aha, I see you want a new cluster. 
Let me look out in the real world. I don't see that cluster there. And so I'm going to go ahead and create that cluster for you. Okay. You want another cluster? You create another machine.yaml and another cluster.yaml, and you create another cluster and another. Okay. So this is one topology that you can have where you have a management cluster. And now the reconcilers running in the management cluster are the ones that are responsible for taking care of each of the target clusters on the right hand side. Now, that's only one topology, and it's a relatively simple and easy to understand topology, right? I hope at least laid out the way it is here. The mechanics of doing all of this, well, the good news is that we're writing automation for this, and you just heard me describe that automation to a large extent. That automation is, um, uh, is what we're doing with these GitOps pipelines, et cetera. But there's another topology that I want to uh, suggest to you. So I'm going to make a little bit of room here and say, well, wait a minute, hang on. The target cluster is itself the Kubernetes cluster. So, hmm, what you might be thinking is that the left-hand side of this picture and the right-hand side of this picture bear some similarities. Can I just do this? Can I have those very things that are in the management cluster running in the Kubernetes cluster that, that it's responsible for? And so what you're starting to see here is hints of what we've been talking about. Remember one of the GitOps patterns that I talked about yesterday was a pull model? And that previous topology sure looked pretty pushish. And so indeed, that's what we're hinting at here. So Yes, so the first answer is yes, what I'm showing you here on the screen, absolutely doable, absolutely running. It, this isn't hypothetical, this does work. And in fact, it works this way in our WeaveWorks product, WKP product that you heard Brees talk about yesterday. This is the, we do have this running on the right hand side. So it's even running in production, pretty cool. So how do I establish that though? Because now I have this bootstrap problem of, well, wait a minute, if I need etcd and I need reconcilers to set up a cluster and I want those things to run in that cluster, how, how do I get that whole thing started? Well, there's a couple of options. You can use the management cluster to bootstrap this self-managed cluster. And the way that you do that is you've established the management cluster, you have done as I described, you've created your machine in cluster.yaml, it has spun up the target cluster, and then you can in effect run this command, which is cluster cuddle move. And it does the effect of moving the machine in cluster uh, YAMLs over into the new cluster, as well as moving the reconcilers over. There's another option as well, though, is what I like to call the self-bootstrapping mechanism. And the self-bootstrapping mechanism says, hey, rather than starting with a management cluster, are there other ways that I can bootstrap this? And that, in fact, is exactly what this open source project does, WKS Cuddle. It does this self-bootstrapping. And to get a little bit techy, the way that it does that self-bootstrapping is it leverages some execution on in the client, in the WKS Cuddle client, to do the bootstrapping, it just barely bootstraps it with a first node and sets up that first control plane node. Then it lets the control plane node, you know, it installs everything, including the machine.yaml and the reconcilers, and then it takes over from there. So the bootstrapping mechanism is really quite thin and then it takes off from there, okay? So this is another topology. So you can continue to have a management cluster, but especially when we start talking about doing this at large scale, and we start talking about doing this in things like edge scenarios, then you start to appreciate, even instinctively, intuitively, you start to feel like, ah, yes, okay, this kind of, the self-management the, the self topology 
is really advantageous in many cases. All right, so to sum up this section on platform, what I've just been talking about is this, is that we have been talking about, all right, how do we do this cluster management? And I'm suggesting that you're gonna use GitOps in the same basic patterns that you did at the application layer to do cluster management. Well, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on it, but here's the thing. We believe that the infrastructure that your application teams need is not just a cluster because that burdens them with too much other stuff above that. There's this whole configuration layer, configuration of the Kubernetes cluster that is also needed. And I called out RBAC here because you saw earlier that there's all sorts of RBAC in setting up policies so it's not just a matter of installing things like Prometheus and Grafana so that your application teams and your platform teams can use it. It's also configuring the cluster with things like network policies and, and role base, you know, a cluster, uh, cluster roles and cluster role bindings and, and role bindings and, 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 and those types of things and, and, and roles. So all of that also get opsable. And um, I don't know whether Brees man mentioned it, I didn't have a chance to take a look at it, but again, kind of calling out what we do have in our WKP product is that we have um, uh, some capabilities there that do that for you in, in the setting of you know, teams. So it allows you to set up tenancy and those types of things. And then of course, there's the application part that I spent at the very beginning. And that of course is gonna be GitOps all the way. So, what you can see here is that you're using that same GitOps pattern across your entire thing. Your platform teams are using it for the two lower layers. Your application teams are using it for the upper layer across. So to sum that up, not going over applications again, but only going over platforms, Cluster API is just brilliant. It allows me, it gives me the bookends. It gives me those things that I got for free in the application setting it brings those along for platforms. I've got a couple of different topologies. I'm also applying all of this to cluster configuration. And how am I doing that? I'm doing that with GitOps pipelines. I'm designing those pipelines for how I'm gonna do, use a cloud native operational patterns to um, manage my platforms. All right. So I think I'm doing just great on time. I've got um, about 10 minutes left, and I think that's just about the right amount of time to talk about this last bucket, which is ecosystem. By ecosystem, I am, yes indeed, inviting you to join us to build out the GitOps capabilities, to continue to enhance those things so that more and more use cases do come for free for the application teams and the platform teams. So let me make that a little bit more concrete and talk about where are the places that you, you're excited about this, you wanna to contribute to this, you work for an ISV and you think, oh my gosh, I want my ISV stuff to be GitOpsable. I want it to be operable in this new modern cloud native way. How do I get started? Where can I, where, where can I offer the things that we have available? That's what I want to spend the last few minutes talking about. Now, yesterday I showed you this picture. I talked about GitOps and then I, I went so far as to say, okay, this is kind of the way that we think about GitOps. And then I said, but what I'd like to do actually is call this the GitOps runtime. The GitOps runtime has a set of delivery controllers and that's where the source controller, Helm controller, customized controller, image automation controller that you know we, we talked about, something else maybe called a profiles controller. I'll get back, get back to that in just a second. There's a whole bunch of delivery controllers there. Then I have a whole bunch of runtime controllers, some of which are baked into Kubernetes to start, things like the daemon set controller, the replica set controller. Then I also, you saw when it came time to thinking about managing clusters, I introduced, there's some additional controllers that you can bring to the table, which are the CAPI controllers. And that's the one that's second from the bottom there, Kubernetes lifecycle management controller. And it doesn't say CAPI, it says CAPI. I'll say more about that. Um, in fact, I'll say more about that right now. Remember that WKS cuddle thing, the self bootstrapping, self-managing cluster? 
under the covers that uses this cluster API for existing infrastructure controller. So it allows us there to um, uh, do that self bootstrapping, excuse me. And the way that that particular controller works is it's, it assumes that the creation of those virtual machines or physical machines is out of band. And all you need to do is provide it SSH keys and IP addresses, and we can turn those machines into a cluster. So that's the particular CAPI provider that we are maintaining here. Um, it is maintained in the open source, but we're maintaining here. We're the primary um, committers on it um, at Weaveworks. So that's the GitOps runtime, delivery controllers, runtime controllers, and then GitOps pipelines are used to stitch those things together. And that right there is, remember we had the picture where we had Git and we had the runtime environment and I had Flux sitting in the middle? Well, it's not just Flux, it's more this GitOps runtime is the thing that bridges the gap between these two things. So what I wanna do now is suggest how you can participate. So I, I've moved the, the the pipelines out, they'll come back in just a moment. And I've made a little space at the top. Well, the first place that I invite all of you, if you've got something that's applicable, is add, help us add to the set of controllers that are part of the GitOps runtime. Bring more delivery controllers. So yesterday, somebody asked about external repositories and kind of was really poking at this, well, I've got external repositories, what are those controllers? What do those controllers look like? Well, we have an alpha and it's available in the, in the Flux repo today. We have an alpha, the ones that are watching the image repositories. So while Stefan answered the question of, you know, not ready for production, that'll happen, you know, in the early part of the year, they are available out there in alpha. But do you have, are you part of an organization that has other repositories that has some kind of storage, whether it be you know, uh, an S3 compliant storage or something like that, and you wanna bring a delivery controller to bear. Um, we do have that, by the way. We do have the S3 that's part of the source controllers. We do support S3, but if you had something else, you can bring in more source controllers, or you can bring in more you know, kind of, if you will, YAML, YAML compilation controllers. So I invite you to bring us more controllers here on this side. The other thing is that you can certainly bring more runtime controllers. So CAPI is a great example of additional runtime controllers. I'll also call your attention to Flagger. Flagger is a runtime controller that is brought into this entire GitOps you know, uh, vision, if you will. And we, it is a, it's a runtime controller that is very applicable in the GitOps space. So that's the first place that you can come and um, participate. Now, the next thing is, I'm gonna move that off to the side and make a little bit more space on my slide, is that you can, of course, use Flux to then, once you've ex you can extend the set of controllers and then using that extended set of controllers and the existing controllers, you can stitch, you can actually create pipelines and those pipelines now are a part of how you can extend kind of turnkey capabilities. So there are, you know, for example, it, it may be a little bit nuanced, but when Stefan runs the flux bootstrap command, what he is doing is he's not only installing a set of controllers, he's also installing a GitOps pipeline that is responsible for the management and automatic upgrade of those very controllers that he's installed. So he is also installing and maintaining a set of pipelines. So you, if you want to do this either internally for your organization or you want to do it more broadly um, for the industry, you can tool up these pipelines that can then be used by a host of people to generate value very quickly so that they don't have to build the pipelines themselves. So there's another place that you can contribute into this ecosystem. And then finally, okay, if I'm building controllers and I'm building these pipelines, what's my delivery mechanism into that? And that's where we have been talking about this concept of profiles. And profiles, what they do is they are a GitOps native or a GitOpsable packaging mechanism. 
that allow you to install things into your runtime that then offer the next set of capabilities to your users. I like to refer to this picture here as the GitOps platform. The GitOps platform supports this construction of GitOps-based workflows and automation. It supports the extension of this GitOps environment for you, the configuration of the GitOps runtime. It provides a programming model for you to be able to tool these things up. And in that programming model, to sum up again, to remind you that there's a number of different kind of programming abstractions that you can use to program that. There's GitOps profiles, which is the bundling mechanism. And actually, let me start at the bottom. There's the controllers, delivery and runtime, stitching things together in the pipelines. And then at the top, the profiles is a way that you can bundle these things together so that the bundles themselves can be Git. GitOps controlled, GitOps managed. So that rounds out our entire picture here. Um, for, for, to sum it up on the ecosystem side, I introduced this notion of the GitOps platform, um, pro, which is really offers this programming model, if you will, an SDK. Um, and here are the things that we're inviting you to contribute. Um, so to put the final bow on it in the last minute that I have available. What I'm really talking about here is developing a community around which, and, and whether you're on the ecosystem side or the application team side or the platform team side, please do continue to leverage the community for education, for ideas, please bring that innovation to the space. That's really one of the fundamental things that we are aiming for with these GitOps days is for that type of sharing. And of course, um, as the CTO of WeWorks, I would be remiss if I didn't say it. Of course, WeWorks can help you with this, when it, either for, with education or with, with, with product. Um, and, and I promise I'm not going to make this whole thing a, you know, an advertisement. I hope that the entire presentation, my intent was really to help you kind of create a mental model for how to think about these things. But again, we certainly can help you in a number of different ways, including through um, our, our community involvement. And with that, I will thank you for your attention, um, both for the last hour, as well as the last two days. Um, and I think that I'm pretty much wrapped up right on time.